I uh, just want to take this moment, because I haven't done it yet, to welcome all of you here and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia we share God's grace by loving people because God accepts us as we are, and He sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. God's Word, in fact, changes lives. And so this morning we are going to be in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. And I want to talk to you this morning about our voice towards God. Uh, Our voice towards God and communicating with God is something we know as prayer. And with any relationship, we all know, I mean, if you're here this morning and you're married, you understand your marriage relationship cannot last if you don't communicate. If you just go throughout your day and you never talk to your spouse, that marriage will be over quick. And that's just the reality of it. Every good, healthy relationship requires good, healthy communication back and forth. And so God has this relationship that he wants to have with us and it requires that you and I communicate with God. Uh, The disciples of Jesus, as they followed him on earth, they recognized the importance of prayer, the importance of communicating with the Father in heaven. And so we read in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, that it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, that is, as Jesus was praying, when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples, they wanted to soak this up. They wanted to know how he was doing it and why he was doing it and what it entailed. And there are lots of prayers that we offer to the Lord. Um, There's quick, short prayers like the prayer that Peter prayed when he was drowning on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew uh, 14 tells us that when he, that is Peter, when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and begin to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted out. We've all prayed prayers like that, have we not? Come on, Noel, we've done it, haven't we? Lord, help me! These quick prayers, you're driving down the road, you're about to get in an accident. Oh, God, you're just calling out, or you're going into a, a business meeting, and you need God's help. Lord, help me real quick. Oh, Lord, I need your help. Or, or you're all of a sudden stuck in this this argument with your wife or your, your husband, and you're like, Lord, help me. It's like you just want to You want to call out to God, and it's a real quick shout out of prayer to God. Then there's also the attitude of this continual open communication with God, like Paul instructed us to have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He said to pray without ceasing. Not that we would go into our room and shut the door and never come out, never eat, never shower, and never work, and never contribute to society. That's not what Paul's talking about. What he's talking about is just this continual attitude of, I'm talking to God. Whether I'm driving down the road and something happens, I can talk to him. I'm walking down the, the street, or I'm at a baseball game, or I'm at work. It's just I have this open line of communication, always ready to talk to God, always ready to tell him what I'm thinking, always willing to sit there and listen to what God has to say. It's just this attitude of being able to readily communicate with God. Now, I think most Christians are pretty good when it comes to prayers like this. We're pretty good at openly, you know, able to talk to God. We're pretty good and very good at just those quick, Lord, help me prayers. But what about date night? Let me explain to you what I mean by that. My wife and I, we're good at those quick communications. Hey, uh, honey, I need this. Can you pick it up? Or hey, can you stop at the store and get me some milk? These quick, hey, this is what I need. This is what I can do for you, whatever. Real quick back and forth. We're also good at all throughout the day just talking to each other, this open line of communication. But sometimes what's necessary for our relationship to be healthy is a date night. Time for us to just separate out from the normal sea of life, separate out from all the busyness, away from all the other people, to just sit at a table and eat some sushi. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Come on. Just where we're, we're you know, sitting across the table from one another, we're looking into each other's eyes. I ask her a question, she responds to me. She asks me a question, I respond to her. There's a back and forth. I'm listening to every word she has to say. She's listening to, to my complaints. You know, <laughs> you know it's just this, it's this back and forth where we're just loving each other and just talking to one another. 
I think we as Christians are missing out on date night with Jesus. I think we need to set aside that time where we're ready to not only talk to God, but listen to what He has to say, to just soak Him up and to just appreciate all that He is and all that He has for us and all that He wants us to do in life. Now, when it comes to our voice towards God and the words that you and I would use towards God, I would tell you that a lot of the times, less is more. It's been said that God has given us two ears and one mouth, and so we should listen twice as much as we speak. Uh, and that's a true fact. In fact, in uh, James chapter 1, it encourages us to be swift to hear and slow to speak. And I think as believers, we're often quick to speak and slow to listen, quick to speak and slow to hear. So we need to stop looking at our voice towards God. We need to stop looking at prayer the way we see it. We need to start seeing it the way God sees it. And that's what we're going to do in the message this morning entitled, Less is More, as we finalize the series called Switch. Now, if you're here today, it's your first time here. We've been in this series now for a little while called Switch. And the idea is there's a way that seems natural to us to think. And there's also a way that the world would want us to think. And God says, stop doing it either of those ways. What I want you to do is start thinking like me, not Tim, but start thinking like God, God would say. Start thinking like God. Start thinking the way He would want you to think. And so we've been talking about various aspects of our lives and how we can make a switch in our thinking. And we're in the final section called our voice. And we've been talking about things like the fact that talk is cheap and that our actions speak louder than our words and that we need a good reputation in order to speak into the lives of people who don't yet know Christ. We also talked about engaging the unbeliever. When is appropriate? Where is appropriate? How is appropriate? Uh, And so if you've missed any of the messages, go to venia.tv forward slash sermons and you can pick those up. But today we're going to conclude this switch series and talk about our voice as we have dialogue with God. Now, let me just confess to you guys, I struggle with this area of my life. Uh, Prayer is very difficult for me because of me. Uh, I struggle with things like asking myself, am I saying the right things? Am am I saying what God needs to hear? Am I saying what God wants to hear? And and I'll pray and I'm like, gosh, you know, and I, I start to beat myself up. Or maybe I'll ask myself, have I said enough? Have, you know, should I be saying more to God? And even as a young believer, I've, I've wanted to spend so much time talking with God, and I would actually time myself sometimes because I would say, oh, I've, I've done too, too little prayer. I mean, my prayer wasn't long enough, so let me just make sure I'll set it for an hour and then make sure I pray for an hour. And I start to beat myself up, and I start to say a lot of stuff to God because I feel like I need to say a lot of stuff to God. And so it's something I struggle with. It's something that's very difficult for me. Sometimes I wonder, have I even heard from God in my prayer time? Maybe uh, I've heard something, but is it, is it God or is it just me? Is it just my own thoughts? Does anybody else struggle like this or is it just the, the holy pastor up here? Okay, so I'm in good company. We all struggle at some level or another. Prayer can be difficult for us as believers and I think God would want to flip a switch in our mind this morning, and so let's see what he might want to do as we open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, and as you're making your way to Matthew chapter 6, let me just tell you that prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. In other words, a dialogue is where two parties are going back and forth. They're both contributing to the conversation. It's not a monologue. We don't do all the talking. We don't sit there and just keep saying words and saying more words and saying more words, and that's a time of prayer. Uh, If your prayer does not consist of you spending time listening to what God has to say, then you are missing out. And it's hard for us to hear the voice of God. Take young Samuel, for instance. When Samuel, the prophet, was young, his mom, Hannah, brought him to the temple, and he was there to serve the Lord all of his days. And she dropped him off at the temple, and there he was serving the Lord, uh, serving Eli. Uh, Eli was the high priest there, and he went to bed one night, and he heard, Samuel, Samuel, and 
he got up, Samuel got up, rushed into the room of Eli, and he said, what is it? And Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And so he, he runs back to bed, and he lays down, and he hears that voice again, Samuel, Samuel. And, and he gets up, and he rushes in. Yes, Eli, what is it? Eli's like, go back to bed. I'm not calling you. And this went on a few times before Eli's brain finally kicked in, and he's like, Oh, Samuel must be hearing from God. And so he instructed young Samuel in 1 Samuel 3. He says, go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. What beautiful advice Eli gives to young Samuel. Speak, because I'm listening. Say to God that he has your attention and then shut your lips and just listen to what God has to say. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. I want to hear your voice. What awesome advice. And so 1 Samuel 3, verse 10, the Lord came and stood and called as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, speak, your servant hears. Beautiful. It's important for us to start to recognize the voice of God in our life. We need to listen a whole lot more than we speak. But there definitely comes a point in time in our prayer life where we need to speak our heart to the Lord. And so he gives us instruction in our text this morning on the how and the where and even the what to say in our communication with the Father in heaven. And so not only does he tell us how to pray, he also tells us how not to pray. Notice in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus says that when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. They just get out there and just say this big, loud prayer that everyone would look at them. Assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, some would say that this verse means don't ever pray in public. You have to understand the intent of God here is not to say don't ever pray in public, but what he's telling you is let's get at the heart. Why is it that you're praying? Are you praying to be seen by men and to have the accolades of men because you're so good to to eloquently say a prayer in front of everyone? Is that what you're doing, trying to draw attention to yourself? Or are you truly trying to just pour your heart out to God and listen to what the Lord would have to say? And so he's trying to get at the heart of the matter. Prayer is to further and to deepen our relationship with God, not to impress other people. Well, if that's not how we should pray, then how should we? Uh, Verse 6 goes on to tell us that when we pray, we should go into our room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Why go into this secret place? Well, life gets busy. Jesus himself had his secret place. He would go on the hillside. He would go on the mountaintop. He would find his way into a deserted place where no one else was around. And he would pray to his Father in heaven. Why would he do that? Because he knew that no matter what happened throughout the day, everybody wanted to come in and talk to him. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to touch the hem of his garment. They wanted him to have lunch with them. They wanted him to go to the house and be entertained. He knew that life would be busy throughout the day. Same with us. It's, not, it's no different. We go throughout the day. We have our schedules that we have to keep. We got to get kids to soccer practice. We got to make sure everyone's fed. We got to make sure the job gets done. The bills get paid. Life is busy. If we don't find for ourselves a place to pray to God, if we don't find ourselves this area that's free from distraction, we're not going to have that time with God that we really, truly need. And so we need to find that place. And once we find that place, then we need to pay attention to the words that we use. This is why in verse 7, it says that when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. If you are anything like Nikki and I, you love to decorate your house with God's Word. We love doing that. We put scriptures up 
in the kitchen. We put them on the refrigerator. We've got, uh, if you know what a mezuzah is, it's a, it's a Jewish tradition, and you have this, um, this little thing on your door, and it's inside it's scrolled up, the Word of God, and so it's right there at your doorpost, and every time you walk into your home, you touch the Word of God, and God's Word is so important to you. We even have it in the bathroom, and we've got it kind of all throughout our house because we love putting God's Word up. Guess what? God uses your words as potpourri. He does. He, he loves when you speak to him, and he stores it up as incense. Psalm 141 says, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 tells us that in heaven there are gold bowls with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And Revelation chapter 8 verse 4 says that the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. And because your words and my words are so important to God, we should choose them wisely. I love what Dan Maidman said earlier. He goes, I wonder if God's going, does that smell good or bad? You know, I mean, our words, when we choose what we're going to say to God, we should choose words that are going to smell good in the presence of God, knowing that they're going to be used to, to fill His throne with incense, that God enjoys it when we talk to Him. We need to choose our words wisely. After all, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2 reminds us that God is in heaven and you are on earth so let your words be few. Less is more. God wants us to choose our words wisely as we offer them up to Him. Not that we can't just have good conversation with Him, but, but to really consider what is it that we're saying to this holy God who can breathe out stars. What are we saying when we open our mouth and speak to Him? He doesn't want us to just use vain repetition. He wants us to choose our words wisely. The ungodly people use vain repetitions. Therefore, verse 8 says, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you need before you ask him. This verse of the Bible is very important for us to understand because it begs the question, why even pray? If God already knows what I have need of, why should I even talk to him in the first place? What's the point? We need to understand this about prayers, that prayer is not an opportunity for you and for me to inform God. It's not a time for us to go, Lord, I, I know you don't know this, but my bills are due next week and the money hasn't come in. I would really appreciate it if you could throw a little more money my, my way because I've got to pay those bills. I know you didn't know, but now you know, so if you could do that, that would be great. It's not like that. God already knows. It's not a time for you and me to inform God what it is. It's a time for God to bring to our own minds the things that He wants us to understand. He wants us to recall our relationship with a holy God. He wants us to recall that our needs and our will needs to be lined up with His will. That we need to recall that our needs come from the realization that He's the one that provides for them. He wants us to recall in our minds the need to give and to receive forgiveness. He wants us to recall in our minds that there's a battle going on between our flesh and our spirit. He wants these things to come up in our own minds. That's why we pray, so we can communicate with God, and communication goes both ways. And so Jesus in verse 9 tells us, if we're going to pray, that, that this is the manner that you and I should pray. We should say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What this does in our minds is it helps us to recall this privileged relationship that you and I have with God. This privilege that we have to be chosen into His family, to be able to call a holy God our Father. You see, before this, this, this idea of calling God Father in heaven, this was revolutionary to people. Nobody ever talked about God as a loving Father in heaven. This was something that people were like, what? You mean I can, 
I can have him as a, of a, uh, as a loving father. And so this is to help us understand and recall in our mind how great it is that we get to know this God, this God that is sovereign over everything, this God that is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at every time, this God that's omnipotent, meaning he has all power, this God that is omniscient, meaning he knows everything, this God that created the entire universe, this God that will judge all things. We can know and we can talk to and we can be loved by Him. That's what this verse does. And since He, that is God, is all those things, our will needs to line up with His will. So verse 10 pleads with Him that His kingdom would come and that His will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And nobody modeled this better than Jesus There Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's sweating out drops of blood. He's so nervous about going to the cross and what's going to happen to him. And he talks to God in heaven. He says, listen, Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass, in other words, if there's any way I don't have to do this, this is going to be terrible. If there's any way I, I, I could do it a different way, if I could save humanity without having to go through this, that'd be awesome. That's the Tim version. It'd be awesome if I don't have to do that. But nevertheless, not my will, but Father, your will in heaven be done. He modeled for us, lining up our will. And that's important for us to understand as we communicate with God because oftentimes our prayer is, Lord, I don't want to go through that. And that's the end of it. We don't then line up our will saying, Lord, if you still want me to go through with this, I will. It's going to be hard. I'm going to need your strength. I'm going to need your courage. I'm going to need your boldness. I'm going to need your patience. I'll go through it. If there's any way around it, that'd be great. But what's your will in my life? That's what God wants us to do is line up our will with His. And verse 11 goes on to request that our Father in heaven would give us this day our daily bread. In other words, give us today what we need today. And we need to make sure as we pray to God that we submit to Him our needs, not our needs. I think oftentimes we're talking to God going, God, I need a new car. And we don't really need a new car. It's just that Mr. Smith next door just got a new car and it's awesome and I want that new car. So Lord, give me a new car. And he's like, you don't need a new car. God wants us to go to Him understanding that He's going to provide for us everything that we need. God loves us, and it's important for us to know that He says that we're to ask for our daily bread. In other words, the most basic of provisions, the most basic of needs. And so bread is that most basic of need, and then verse 12, forgiveness is the most basic of the, I'm sorry, the most basic principle of Christianity. Verse 12 says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Maybe your, ver- your Bible says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. What this does is it recalls in our mind the idea that we have fallen short of God's glory. Every single one of us, we mess up all the time. None of us is perfect. Not only that, not only do we recognize that we have fallen short, but we recognize that other people have fallen short, and they've even fallen short doing things against us. And God says, listen, I don't want you to just want to be forgiven for yourself. I want you to be willing to take that forgiveness and offer it out to other people. That's why I always open up the service with the, the idea that God, we're sharing God's grace. God has poured grace out upon us. We should be so willing to just dish that back out to other people. God says, look, I want you when you pray, I want you to recognize you've fallen short. I want you to ask for forgiveness, turn from that sin, turn back towards me, and be willing to share that with everyone. But you don't know what he did, Pastor Tim. How could God ask me to do that? He, he's not asking. He's demanding that we give forgiveness, that we share that grace with other people. And the first half of verse 13 reveals to us the battle going on between our flesh and our spirit. It pleads with God to not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's a battle going on, 
And every single one of us, if you are a believer here this morning, something is going on and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Something is saying, come this way, do what God wants you to do, do the right thing, make the right choices, and then there's this other part of you that says, yeah, but this is so much more fun. This is so much easier. And your flesh wants you to do things that fall short of God's glory. The Apostle Paul intimates this principle for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he says that the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. God knows that we struggle. It's not a surprise. It's not like you do something wrong and God's like, oh, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. God's like, I knew, I knew you were going to do that. I knew, but, but next time do it this way. And you start, you start to realize that God, God's going to give you opportunity to step away from that way of life. And in those opportunities, if you call out to God, God, don't, don't lead me down that road, Lord. Help lead me this way. God's going to give you what you need to endure temptation, to pull through it without actually committing the sin. Well, finally, the second half of verse 13 closes the prayer by praising God and crediting Him with all the glory. It says this, that God's is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And with this being said, everything that God wants us to know about how we're to communicate with Him, I think the Lord would still tell us that He wants us to know that less is more. Less is more. We need to let God do most of the talking when we're praying. We need to sit down and zip our lips and let God speak to our hearts. And you might be sitting here this morning saying, well, I'm, I'm like young Samuel. I don't know what God's voice sounds like yet. I don't understand. You're telling me that, that I need to talk to God and say words to God, but that I need to shut up and I need to just listen to the voice of God. But what does that even look like? Let me give you seven things this morning, seven ways that God speaks into your heart and into your mind and into your life. And the very first one, and probably the most important one, is that God will speak to you through His written Word. It is His primary way of talking to His children. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this, that all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God's Word teaches us to do what is right. It speaks into our situation. What am I supposed to do right now? And you read God's Word and He says, this is how I want you to handle it. And I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to people who tell me, I've heard from the Lord and it does not line up with Scripture. I've heard it time and time again. God told me to divorce my wife. He did? Yep, God told me. Really? Oh yeah, well why, why did God tell you to divorce your wife? Because she ain't respecting me. She's supposed to respect me. God's word says it. Hold on a second. So you're telling me that you heard from God that you're supposed to divorce your wife. Yep. But God's word says that he hates divorce. That's what God's word says. That's what, he, that's what the almighty God in heaven wrote down for us to understand about divorce is that he hates it. And so you're telling me you heard from God that you're supposed to divorce. Oh yeah, God, it's God. I know it's God. I would tell people like that, you're probably not hearing God's voice. You're just hearing your own brain. You're just hearing what you want to think or what other people have spoke into your lives. Now, does God give room for divorce in his word? Yeah, I'm not telling you that everybody who's got divorced is sinning. I'm just telling you, by and large, and if you look at the principles in God's word, that's what he hates. But people will do it all the time. I've heard God wants me to borrow all this money. Why? Because I'm going on a vacation, and I'm going to get new carpet in the house, and da 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 and they start listing out all these things. And I say, well, hold on a second. God says in his word not to rack up debt. He doesn't want us to be slaves to money. He wants us to be slaves to Him. 
No, but God wants me to borrow it. No, I, I know it. I would tell people, listen, you are not going to God's word. God speaks to us primarily through his word. And so we need to make sure that whenever we think we're hearing from God, that it lines up with his word. The second way this morning I want to share with you that God speaks to us is through his Holy Spirit. And this is one of the greatest benefits that you have as a born-again believer. It's a promise from Jesus Christ himself. He said in John 14, 26, that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. God's Spirit dwells within you as a believer. He's going to bring these things out in your mind. You're going to be going through life going, what is it that I should do right now? And His Spirit will start to bring up in your mind, oh, that's right, God says this in His Word, and God says that, and He'll bring it up and start to minister to your heart and to your spirit. And if we'll spend less time talking and more time listening to the leading of God's Spirit in our lives, we'll start to understand that He is speaking loud and clear. We need to just zip our lips and listen to God. Well, the third way I want to share with you this morning is that God will speak to us through words of knowledge and word of wisdom. And what I'm talking about here is a principle that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it tells us that a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. God's Spirit, speaking into the hearts and lives of people, will give them a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, and then they share that with other people, and it helps encourage them in their walk. God has used my wife in this way in my life. Before I ever became a pastor, before I ever thought I would be a pastor, before I ever considered being a pastor, God spoke to my wife and said, your husband's going to be a pastor. And she came to me and she was the one that told me, God told me you're going to be a pastor. There were things going on in our lives, circumstances that were happening that, that were lining up to, to make major changes in our lives. And I knew that these circumstances were taking place, but I didn't know why. God gave that message to my wife and she shared it with me. That's how it works. And it was a blessing for me to hear because I knew all these things were going on. I just didn't know why. But then God chose to speak to my life through her. Now, something similar to that word of wisdom and word of knowledge, God will speak to us through godly counsel. There's a lot said in God's word, and I don't know any one person who knows it all. And so it's important for us to go to other people when there's situations in our lives and we don't know what God's Word says about it. We go to other people and get counsel and they'll open up God's Word and say, here's where it is. Here's what God says. And so God will use counsel to speak into our lives. And of course, it goes back to His Word, but it's still God using a counsel, a person counseling you to bring that to light. There's also confirmation. God speaks to us through confirmation. Three years after my wife told me that I was going to be a pastor, another pastor came to me. A pastor came up and said, hey, God's called you to be a pastor, hasn't he? It was an amazing thing for me because it was confirmation. I mean, I already believed my wife and I knew that God had spoken to her. And three years went by and all of a sudden somebody else comes up to me and confirms that in my life. So God will use that confirmation as a way of speaking into our lives. He's like, look what I told you. I told you it then, and I'm telling you now. It's confirmed. God wants us to hear that he is speaking into our lives. And not only does he speak in those ways, he also speaks by giving us a peace that surpasses understanding. There's this peace that you and I can have as believers that doesn't make sense to anyone else. The Apostle Paul, while he's speaking to the church at Philippi, he said that believers in Jesus will experience God's peace. They'll experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It's an amazing thing, that peace of God that speaks volumes into our lives. And you can see it in the life of a believer. People who lose their job and they're like, that's all right. 
What do you mean it's all right? You lost your job. How are you going to pay for this? How are you going to go there? What are, you, what are you going to do? And the non-believer will look at us like, you're crazy. You're saying everything's going to be all right, but you just have this peace. Somebody just died. It's, it's going to be all right. First of all, they're in heaven, and God's going to give me comfort, and you just go about it with this peace, and people look at you like, What? But God is speaking loudly in that peace, saying, I'm here. I know what you're going through. I love you. I care about you. I want you to feel my peace. And he shows up, and his spirit's there, just ministering to our hearts, giving us this peace that totally goes against our understanding. There's no way I should feel this peace right now, but I feel the peace of God. It's his voice speaking in to our lives. And finally, God speaks to us, in our circumstances. He speaks to us in circumstances and in timing. Things like him telling Peter, hey Peter, go down to the sea, cast a line in, when you bring up a fish, there's going to be money in that fish's mouth so we can pay this tax. And what does Peter do? He goes down there, throws in the line, catches a fish, and in its mouth is money. I mean, in those circumstances, it's like, Okay, God's speaking. It's true. The circumstance shows that he's speaking into my life. Or he told a couple of his disciples, go ahead of me. Go into that village. There's going to be a couple of donkeys tied up. Tell the person there that you want them and that I have need of them. And so they go ahead and the circumstances revealed that there's donkeys and everything that God said was true. And so God's speaking loudly into their lives. I was talking to Bill Shadden this morning. He's the one that bring the pulpit out earlier. Bill's always back there praying for me before I come out here and giving the message, and he was sharing with me this morning. He didn't even know what the message was about, but he's sharing with me. He says, you know what? God spoke to me in my circumstances a couple weeks ago. I said, oh, really? I was excited to hear it because I'm like, that's exactly what we're talking about this morning. He goes, yeah. He goes, I was at a, I was at a stoplight to turn left and I'm waiting for my light to turn green. Finally, it turns green, and the guy ahead of me, he goes, and I should have just went right along with him, but for some reason, I stopped, and this other car comes barreling through, went right through the red light, and he says, if I wouldn't have stopped, I would have pulled out. He would have slammed right into my door, and he goes, I know. That was God speaking to me, telling me that I'm here, and I know, and I love you, and, and he goes, I could just tell it was God's voice speaking in to my life. And I'm telling you, this kind of thing happens to us all the time. God is just shouting out into our lives. And I think sometimes we get in situations like that and we just drive off. We don't stop and go, oh my God, that's you. That's my God. That's him speaking to me, telling me, I'm here. And I think God is just screaming into our lives lately. I think he's screaming into the lives of the leaders of this country. Hello, I'm here. Do you not hear me? He wants us to know he's real. He wants us to know he cares. He wants us to know he has a plan. He wants us to know there's another way. And he's speaking out, shouting out into our lives. And people are just walking along going, oh my and they don't know. God says, will you just listen. Shut your mouth for a little bit. I know we all have so much to say and we want to be heard, but God wants us to close our mouths and listen to what he has to say. It's really interesting to me that the, uh, the disciples of Jesus asked him to teach them how to pray. They didn't say, Lord, will you teach me how to walk on water? That was really cool. And only Peter got to do it for a little bit, but I want to do that. Show me how to do that. Or, hey, you know what? It was really cool, Lord. You broke up that fish and you broke up that bread. It was just a couple of fish and a couple of bread. You broke it up. You fed thousands of people. Show me how to do that. Or they, that dude, Lazarus, he was dead. He was dead for three days. You told him, get up out of the grave, walk. And he did it. I want to know how to do that. They didn't ask him, show me how to do those things. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. I want to know how you communicate with your Father in heaven. How do you have this connection? Because there's obviously some sort of connection there that leads to all this other stuff, all these things that you've done, all this greatness, all these miracles, all these lives that you've healed and you've touched and you've perfected and you've done amazing things. 
It's all connected with your ability to communicate with your Father in heaven. Teach me that. That's what I want to know how to do. And that has to be our prayer this morning. Let's pray as a church.